Thank you uh, all. Um, uh, there's a lot going on in trade now. Uh, trade is a hot topic in Australia. And there, when they asked me to do this, I could have done a lot of different things, uh, all different trade agreements that are relevant, uh, that have passed, that are pending, that are in progress, that are speculative, that they're going to launch. I could have talked about a lot of things. But one thing I do like to do, and I don't really get the chance to do it all that often, is talk about South Australia. Everybody wants to know about China, and everybody wants to know about wherever else it happens to be. And that's fine. That's what I do for a living. But um, I like it when I can talk about South Australia and when I can do something that might help. Uh, I live here, and um, I think it's a pretty good place. Um, this is something um, that I've known about uh, as an issue in South Australia bef before I came to live here. And um, uh, I've known about it because uh, it was you know, something, as uh, mentioned earlier, um, or at least alluded to, I did for a living. Um, I actually started doing this in, when I was still in law school. I wrote a paper on the protection of uh, wine names. And I went to the fellow who I was told was the top expert in Washington, D.C. on that. And I handed him the paper, and I had a case study based on a, uh, a bottle that I found in my local bottle shop, Gamay Beaujolais from California. And I said, that just doesn't seem to fit, doesn't seem to work. And so I did a whole case study in my paper about that bottle. What I didn't know is that he was a lawyer for French wine. And he was exceedingly happy that I came to him for advice, because he ran a case based on my paper and won. And um, I was hooked. That was uh, something I've wanted to do ever since. And um, I went to work. My first job in government was with uh, the International Affairs Office in the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And I went on to negotiate free trade agreements, in part uh, doing the trademark and geographical indications negotiations. I did the uh, US-EU wine negotiations and um, actually met my wife negotiating the World Wine Trade Group uh, discuss in the discussions on ontological practices and wine labeling. I went on to negotiate at the uh, WTO and uh, ended up in charge of the policy um, at the, uh, for the United States government. And of course, now I'm here. And, um, it's still relevant, uh, relevant to the point where I've been asked to do some study on geographical indications in Australia. And I'm happy I had the help of a brilliant uh, economics PhD student who, uh, without whom the data would have just uh, made me run and hide. On thanks so much. I didn't know you'd come tonight. But uh, uh, when I get to it, I'll have to tell you that I'm actually not talking about that paper. Um, but that paper, uh, there's a, just a tangent, a bit of that paper that I'll talk about because it's relevant to us here in South Australia. But first, how did this come to South Australia? Of course, it's the wine capital. Uh, but much more has developed over time. We have beautiful produce here, and agriculture is uh, key and seminal to a lot of regional branding. What comes from the earth? Uh, sure, regional branding might uh, center a lot of, around a lot of things. Uh, I'm sure in Alice Springs, uh, they're not really talking about uh, what's coming out of the ground other than stone, a very big one, right in the middle of uh, a lot of other nothing. And so that's regional branding. But uh, in case of uh, products and um, what grows around them, uh, agriculture really is sort of the main game, and we do it very well here in South Australia. But wine is where a lot of it started, uh, at least in terms of, again, remember, I'm from the Institute for International Trade, and I'm a lawyer. So I'm talking about uh, the regulatory schemes as well. Where did this grow, and how is this fostered here? Um, and in uh, the early 90s, there was an agreement between the EU and Australia 
on trade and wine. And that's when your McWilliams sparkling Shiraz went away, or sparkling Burgundy, excuse me, went away, and it became sparkling Shiraz. Or at least when that was implemented, that's when it happened. That's when champagne went away and it became sparkling wine here. Um, but that's what the EU wanted was the names. So those were conceded in, uh, in exchange for market access, but in doing so, Australia implemented a geographical indication system for wine uh, here in Australia. Now, what's happened since is with the rise of popularity of those regions and the less dependence on other terms, well, wine is an agricultural product. Is that all they grow in wine regions? No. Other regional products started to gain notice and favor with the growing popularity of the wine in some of those regions. Now, uh, we have terrific regions all through South Australia, and they're all brilliant. But uh, like I mentioned before, I know you can all speak. So when people come into South Australia from out of state, or they come in from out of the country, or they, they, they're coming to Adelaide, they're visiting, and you want to showcase, you want to take them someplace, or you want to give them good produce, good food, a good experience, a beautiful place, uh, you, you say to them, and you, I want you to say the word for me. You say, have you been out to Barossa? Uh, thank you. You know what? I've been giving talks for 20 years, and that's never worked. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to remember this one. You actually said the word I was hoping you'd say. Um, um, the, so there's a, a range of things that are associated with Barossa now, but the seminal point is the wine. And the protection of that name is under a, uh, a legal instrument that was adopted pursuant to an international treaty. But there's a big international debate about this. Why? Barossa, the stuff comes from the Barossa, right? Piece of cake. So you call it Barossa. This has been debated at the WTO for 20 years now, and there's no sign of it being solved. I had great fun there because I actually was a subject matter expert. Quite a few negotiators in Geneva. I don't know if you're familiar with negotiations in Geneva. I used to call it a fact-free zone. Um, quite a few of them had no idea what they were going to negotiate about tomorrow, but they tried to get their heads around the room they were in today. And so there wasn't a great deal of expertise around uh, on the subject matter at hand. Everybody knew what their brief was. But I actually was sent there because I had study and I had practice and I knew about these things. And it occurred to me right away that we were all talking about apples and oranges. There was no actual agreement as to what a geographical indication was, even though it was defined by the WTO in the TRIPS agreement, the Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. Um, TRIPS. There's a definition in there, and I love it because it defines an in a geographical indication as an indication. Well, that's a good start. An indication is an indication, and it just gets less clear from there. But um, we were talking about different things. And it made people angry when I pointed that out because they didn't want to go backwards. They wanted to go forwards. They wanted to implement something. They wanted an instrument. They wanted something. And I said, no, we have to actually deconstruct this so we know what we're talking about. And it drove them crazy. So I had a little bit of fun doing that. But, and I thought I knew that was the answer. But this recent research has pointed out, and how things work in Australia in particular, pointed out that not only is that the case, but there's more than 100 years of history and um, uh, legal uh, precedent and legal uh, evolution of legal culture that goes into that difference of opinion and that uh, not knowing what it is we're all talking about. And it's very deep-seated. And, and some of it is um, 
due to circumstances in the different countries where these different traditions evolved, legal traditions, uh, as well as agricultural practices. And um, it's so complex uh, that that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight. Because I could talk about it until next week. Um, uh, but basically, um, it is apples and oranges. I'll get into a little bit of it later, but um, uh, what I'm going to talk about is this sort of little side effect. Something's happened in this process, and it's been lost in 20 years of arguing. Because we all joined the WTO when it uh, first uh, came into existence in 1994, basically opened its doors in 1996, or where the countries have exceeded since then, uh, joined up uh, since that's happened. What's, what's happened is that because there's so many different definitions and so many different ideas based on our own experiences, such as Australia's experience in, in uh, intellectual property protection and agricultural practice and other things, that um, the way the obligations and under the TRIPS agreement for geographical indications have been adopted by countries is about compliance with the WTO and not really about protection of geographical indications. What do I have to do to be compliant so that I can have the benefit of this big overarching agreement because I don't actually know what this other guy wants from me, but what will technically work? And so people who really want something and know what's happening and have been using different systems for years implement what they like, and others just do it because it fits. And the latter is more prevalent than the former. So I say uncontrolled economic and legal experimentation is because there was not a lot of foresight in saying, okay, we're going to put in a system of protection for place names. Think about it. We're going to say that this has value, and we're going to allow you to build value in a limited geographical area for production of something. So there it is. It's now finite. How do you control it? What does that mean? Who can take advantage of that and who's going to benefit from that? Well, that's, none of those were asked. It was, okay, these are the sort of squidgy, not clear obligations that are drafted broadly enough that anybody, any country could fit that into their legal system. If we can craft some language that makes everybody happy, they'll go away. Or, in the case of Australia, they'll give us market access for our wine in Europe. So we'll put something in place that meets the criteria. But did they say, what's that protection going to mean for Australia, other than what they got in the deal, as opposed to what the system was going to do over time? And that was a great deal. Market access for Australian wine was Fabulous. Uh, we took over the UK market, which is one of the most dynamic uh, wine markets in the world. Australian wine back in the early 2000s was dominating that. Um, but is the system good or bad? Is it effective or ineffective? And the question is, for what purpose was it adopted? And what purpose does it serve now? And that I'm not sure that anybody's actually asked. Oh, wait a minute. My topic is regional branding. And um, regional branding and geographical indication protection are actually different things. So what am I on about? Why am I going on about this? Well, if you know anything about it, they're actually, they're related. Because it's in, in part because there's similar motivation behind regional branding and the protection of geographical indications. And some of those motivating factors might be cohesion and cooperation in rural production, promoting high value 
quality products so that those regional products bring more profit in to those regions, more money into those regions. Economies of scale. Do you think small Colombian uh, coffee growers have great access to the world coffee market? Probably not by themselves, but when you put 563,000 of them together, you get the Colombian Coffee Federation, and they can enter the market as a block with a lot more power than uh, can the individuals on their own. And that market access allows them to take advantage of the world market. It also uh, can give them security and stability in the market. What does he mean by that? Well, red wine. Anybody here like red wine? You live in South Australia, gee, I hope you do. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, I, I enjoy it too much. But um, I should have enjoyed some before this, and so should you. <laughs> Not only do I sound better, I look better if you do. But, but um, if there's a shock to the wine market or to something else, currency. You remember back in the early 2000s, uh, Argentina had a little bit of a, an economic problem? I traveled to Argentina not very long after that all broke, and uh, I traveled through the wine region. And I bought... Uh, 12 bottles of wine. And that cost me, 12 good bottles of wine, cost me 20 US dollars because their currency was worth almost nothing at that point. So if what you're buying is red wine and you can get good value for very little, if red wine is the determining factor, then you go buy from Argentina at that point. But if what you want is a Barossa Suarez, where do you go for it? There's one place. That's the idea. Get people to want that thing from that place, and there's only one guy to go to, the producer in Barossa, the producer in McLaren Vale. If that's what you want, and you build that brand recognition and reputation, then they have some stability and some security in the market. And of course, that means jobs in rural and remote locations. And geographical indications can be a tool for regional branding. And that works that way here in Australia. They work together. But the international debate is actually highlighted very well um, uh, by the difference in the implementation of these obligations that we have at the WTO. The European Union is a huge proponent of the protection of geographical indications, but the protection their way. And in Europe, for example, if you had Parmigiano-Reggiano for cheese, you're not going to find pretty much anything else but cheese from that place with that name on it. Here in Australia, a Barossa product couldn't be wine, which is what you'd expect, but it can be cheese. It can be almonds. It could be potatoes. Uh, it can be sausages, and it can even actually be a hot air balloon ride. And the basis of that is here that um, if you're not confused and you all look you know, particularly intelligent, actually, as a crowd, uh, this is a pretty sharp looking crowd, you might be able to tell the difference between a potato and a glass of red wine. And if you can, you're likely not going to be confused if you use the word barasana, both of them. So that's OK here. Wouldn't be in the, the EU. And that derived out of uh, Le Crise de Vin, the, the, the wine crisis in France uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, most, uh, you might have heard of uh, phylloxera. It's, it was very popular in France around the time. Uh, it's uh, a disease, it's actually a, a, a pest that gets into the, uh, the roots, uh, gets into the plant, and kills off the plant. 
they had, that was the, a big part of that crisis. There were other things and other pestilence and other factors, but the French wine industry took a tremendous hit. And they said, geez, what do we do? We need to get back into the market, build our market share again, and raise some stability because our rural communities took a tremendous hit. And they devised this system by which they protect uh, their uh, products, and it's very rigid and very specific to those products. Very different than having a Metwurst, a wine, on a hot air balloon ride with the same name. Is it better? Is it worse? Is there a problem with that? The, the, really, no. But it's just a different uh, evolution of legal and regulatory culture to, and that, that really stemmed from different situations on the ground. But then evolved over years before we came back together and started talking about the fact that we all had now common international obligations that read on the subject. I have these goals. I had them somewhere. Ah, here are the goals, by the way, that I was talking about. Um, what do you want to do with uh, regional branding? Uh, that cohesion and cooperation, high value products, economies of scale, stability. But how do you do that? And a great term I've come across is valorization. And Barossa is great for that. And a lot of these places are great for that. And the best thing you can do is go talk to somebody who's passionate about where they produce and you'll hear valorization. The place is the place. Wine comes from here. Everybody else is, you know, they, they, they're trying to catch up to us. You make it the hero. Make that the hero. And the question that comes up then is, how do you valorize the term properly to get all of those benefits that we talked about? And um, now regional branding and GIs don't sound so easy anymore. And it's true, it's not that easy to do and it's not that easy to accomplish. But I'll give you an example. I'll give you a couple of examples of the valorization of the, of the, of the product. In Comte cheese, I couldn't figure out the, the little accent on the E, but uh, from France, is a quintessential French cheese. I mean, French and cheese, uh, that, that's big to start with, but this is really, uh, this is the poster child for French cheese. Um, talk about the production standards being rigid. The type of cow I've never heard of, but it has a long French name and it's from the region. I mean, it was probably there before people were there. Um, uh, but um, how the cows feed and on what is, is regulated, um, how the milk is uh, collected from the cow, what's done with it at every stage until it's put on the truck and sent to the market. Every step of the way is prescribed and it's in law. It's adopted into the law. So every step of the process the cow is a hero. It's a special cow because Comte can only come from those cows, not these cows. Any cow you can name, I guarantee you won't name this cow. So all those cows, they're not heroes. This cow with the long French name, hero. Under this brand, sales increased by 15 million tons between 1992 and 2005. Five times more jobs are created than in French industrial cheese uh, production. And in doing so, by valorizing every step of the way, the guy who collects the milk is important. The way they do it is important. What the cow eats is tremendously important. So they say that a, a cow in this region can uh, graze on up to 160 different kinds of plants in a field in that region 
and that's what makes the milk special to make a special cheese, they preserve that ecosystem. They preserve that biodiversity there so they can preserve the process and still call it Comte. Wow, that's a little intense. Um, and this, this system developed the way it did, this protection system, because of developed originally out of that French wine crisis. How do we get everybody a stable and steady job in agriculture? You make them a hero at every step of the way, and then because they're heroes, the end product from that region is a big deal, and you want it. And they were able to sell that. It worked. It worked for them. But does it go too far? Is it, well, let's put a name to it. Is it crazy? Well, in Gruyere, the cows are kept in large, I guess barns you'd call them, large holding areas, because they cannot go out to the grass to feed, because they might poo on the grass. So they cut the grass and bring it to the cow by hand. That's part of the production process. Okay, that's a little bit insane, but um, somebody's got a job cutting grass and tending cows and making sure that instead of letting them graze in the fields, they're fed and watered and everything else in, in this way, it's creating jobs. Wow. And that actually works, and I'll pay more because the cow hasn't pooed on the grass. Well, I didn't, you know, most people don't know that, but that's the rationale. Will we do, actually do that here in Australia? I don't know. Some people might. Can it be abused? And this is where it gets, this is where the, uh, the EU in particular lost momentum in trying to get this concept across. Um, because they were doing their regional branding and they were selling the fact that their products were special because of these very strict regulations. But there was a caveat, and that was in labeling. They said, well, our things are very special. Your things are special too. But unless you do what we do, have those kind of regulations from the cow itself all the way to the market, from the seed, from the soil to the bottle, then you cannot use a geographical indication when you sell into the European Union. But you, to, uh, but you also need a geographical indication on the package if you're going to say what kind of cheese it is, or what variety of wine it is, what vintage year the wine is, um, uh, what production methods you use for the wine. So basically, you could call it red wine or white wine, and that was the only thing you could do if you were going to sell into the European Union. And these were the regulations they promulgated to go with it. They never actually passed because the WTO had a few things to say about that, and uh, the membership had a few things to say about that. But it um, took away, in some respect, from uh, something that should have been highlighted, this is done for a reason. They're trying to get all of those benefits of regional branding and uh, doing it through geographical indication protection. Tequila, they like the idea of uh, growing the regional brand and getting that uh, value in the name, the limited area of production so nobody else could do it, and then um, to, um, uh, to um, uh, have that benefit flow on to their country. And so it was protected in 1994. Between 1995 and 2005, production doubled. However, there was no production standard for tequila. There was only the geographic region that tequila could come from. So they didn't... <laughs> talk about the agave plants or the skill of the local farmers or how they did things and how tequila was supposed to be made. So the people who started making tequila uh, in uh, large quantities and uh, in earnest 
uh, the top four producers were all foreign spirits conglomerates. And the top four, uh, those top four, produce the lion's share of tequila. The next five largest producers collectively make 2% of the tequila made. So you see uh, what's happening here. And since there's no production standard, uh, it's a business. So they uh, were creative in how they make tequila. They, um, uh, they uh, excluded the local farmers from the production chain. They make the tequila there. They bring in industrial farming practices to shoot agave out of the ground and harvest it the way they want to harvest it. But traditional practices and uh, tequila making practices went one way and industrial tequila making went another way. And that actually also caused environmental degradation. Uh, because the traditional practices were sustainable and uh, the practices that were employed now aren't. But they're making money hand over fist. They're doing great. Hey, they protected the name. They did regional branding. They gave it a geographical indication, said only these guys can use this. And that's exactly what's happening. In the region, they're making the stuff and they're selling tons of it. Works, right? Oh. Maybe there's more to this. By the way, I was working at the United States Patent and Trademark Office when tequila producers came, the, the Mexican Tequila uh, Association came and said, we want a certification trademark for tequila. Here's our certification standard. And you know, Jose Cuervo, Herradura, all of these others, they weren't made by that standard. It was the bulk of the tequila coming into the United States. We had to say, no, we won't protect your geographical indication because you're not certifying the actual product that's here in the United States. And people already have rights to sell that here. So you can't say you came first. And um, it took a long time for them to figure that out. They are protected in the United States now, but they had to figure out what it was that they had left to protect. Um, did this deliver results for them? A couple of others, just to show you some diversity in it. Idaho potatoes. I've got a good friend of mine who's in charge of uh, protection of the term Idaho potatoes. This fellow can tell you anything about potatoes you ever wanted to know. You go to a restaurant with him and he'll and eat mashed potatoes, and he'll tell you what variety they are and how they were treated from the ground to the point where they were mashed. And he said, those are really good, huh? He goes, that's the new dehydrated potato product. And you say, you're at a fancy restaurant. I said, are they using dehydrated potatoes? He goes, yeah, the quality is fantastic. And he said, but you can tell because of this. And it's like a uh, sommelier with wine. It's hilarious. However, what's not hilarious is the fact that the levies collected are 12 and a half cents US per 100 pounds of potatoes produced. Since they grow 13 billion pounds of potatoes every year, that's $1.625 billion that they spend on promotion, protection, and policing of that brand. That's the budget. Not half bad, I and mean, it's good work if you can get it. Colombian Coffee has 2,655 employees as of when I looked at the, la the website last with offices in the US, Netherlands, Japan, and China. And as I mentioned earlier, they represent 563,000 coffee growers, coffee producers. What does that mean? What, well, where's success and where is failure? And what, is the, uh, what are the common denominators for success? Production standards, investment, and time. Production standards actually raise the cost of producing the product, but your cost actually is offset because you're raising the quality image and charging a lot more for it. So the production, you're not too concerned about if it works. Investment is constant, and that's unfortunate for people who want to start anew uh, or build their regional uh, brands because uh, quite often they don't have a lot of money. Uh, a lot of these, particularly around Europe, are subsidized. 
and the uh, Emilia Romana region in Italy, where uh, Parmigiano Reggiano and Prosciutto di Parma come in uh, over a five year period between, I think, 2007 and 2012, I think that's the period, they spent almost 20 million euros <coughs> basically uh, promoting and uh, subsidizing production of uh, regional branded goods just for that region. And time. You don't build a brand in a day, at least not like this. They tend to come over time, and they tend to, um, uh, they tend to um, have a history behind them. Uh, you know, I mentioned Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, I think it was uh, somewhere in the 1200s is the first writing anybody's found uh, talking about the cheese from Parma the special cheese from Parma. And it was Boccaccio, I think, in the 1400s who wrote a story about the magical mountain made of shaved cheese from Parma, where the, the inhabitants of the mountain used to make hand make pasta and roll it down the hill uh, so that it became covered like a snowball and, and gained more and more uh, when it got to the bottom. And everybody would sit at the bottom of the mountain and eat the pasta with the cheese on it. And that's, um, that's pretty good history. That's, that, that's a lot of time to build up a brand. But what's happening here that might affect some of the issues? And wine is a good example. Because we export 65% of production. So we want people to know who we are. We want to, we're in the world market, we want that stability and that um, uh, stability, we want that um, um, security in the market so that people will keep coming back to us because we depend on those. Well, the dollar did a few funny things in the past few years. It's almost back to where it was, but it went from 60 US cents to almost a dollar 20. What happens to your exports of anything at that point? They go down, particularly during the nice little global financial crisis that we happen to have at the same time when people are not spending discretionary money. They're certainly not spending it on wine as much. During that time, something funny happened. One of the funny things that happened, what happened to growers in South Australia? Are they really happy these days? Were they happy during that whole period? Were they the heroes? It was Barossa, you know, hey, the growers, they're a happy bunch. Supermarket owned brand wines had a market value of 3% of the market in 2006. By 2010, that was 11%, but it meant also 19% of the volume of the entire wine market in Australia. Something's going on here. What's happening? Would regional branding help to bring and capture value that can be spread across the regions that produce these goods and give them a little bit of comfort and security. Is that what our system is set up to do? So should we have rigid protection? Should we be the EU? Well, that assumes homogeneity in uh, food and wine production and consumption across Australia. Is that the case? Australians like the same thing over and over again? Well, well, if it's meat and three veg, yeah, okay, I'll get that. And, but in wine, it's pretty diverse. And in other agricultural products, in cheese, in, um, in small goods, they're all different. They're all, um, uh, there's a lot of innovation. And uh, new and quality products uh, to suit tastes um, are, uh, rather important. Um, the funny thing, talk about the big producers. Um, we have uh, Pernod Ricard here in uh, South Australia, and um, they also happen to be a large spirits company, if you weren't aware. They have interests in Irish whiskey and Scotch whiskey and bourbon whiskey. Well, guess what kind of barrels they're using to age their South Australian wine? over at Jacobs Creek. Used old 
Irish whiskey, Scotch whiskey, bourbon whiskey barrels. They're starting to bring them over and create a new product. Well, if you had a rigid standard on how you aged your wine, you couldn't do that and call it Barossa wine. And um, exclusive use. We'll talk about Barossa again later, but um, part of the study we did was how people use geoterms, geographical terms in Australia, particularly in marketing and in trademarks. And a full 10% of the registered trademarks in Australia are, incorporate some way or another a geoterm into them, which, is, which can be something like um, just a mountain or stream or something like that, but in many cases uh, incorporate the name of places themselves. And so we use them for a lot of things, but as I mentioned earlier, once Barossa became popular for wine, it also became popular for a lot of things. Um, the Barossa Farmer's Market sells a range of Barossa produce. There's almonds, there's cheese. The, I mentioned the Metwurst. Uh, too bad Kim's not here because Ondorf is famous for it and uh, out of the Barossa. Um, so here in Australia, we tend to use what are protected for wine as geographical indications on a whole range of things. And again, why might this not work for us? In the uh, 1950s, there were less than 30 wine varietals planted across Australia to produce wine. And now there's over 140. Now, if you know anything about the standards, the, you know, the kind of standards I was describing for Comte cheese apply in the wine industry in Europe. So you're not going to suddenly introduce new varietals. No, no, it's strict. It's you're going to use these kind of grapes this way, and that's what this product is. It's not the way we do things around here. But should we just rely on the name and the place if that's what we're going to use to try to achieve some of these goals? Because that fails by itself to valorize the full value chain. That doesn't give you the protection. It might be able to raise value in the term, but it's not necessarily going to raise value from the cow to the market or from the, from the vine to the bottle. You still build real value, but the benefits, who's getting it and is it shared? And is it regional? So what do you do? Now, a system based on consumer perception, which is sort of a regional branding system, a trademark system for all products. We can do that for all products here. Or the system that we have for wines. They fit within the Australian legal paradigm. We need then to uh, have collectivization and control of those regional brands, usually by producer groups, can be uh, quasi-governmental because quite often the control of a name and a term and a place and a production standard, a government can have a role in that and does. Uh, the Idaho potatoes um, uh, and um, what else? Uh, Jamaica Blue Mountain Coffee uh, and, and, and others like that. But in others, uh, Napa Valley Wine, for example, they have some government support, but that's uh, that's private. So they've collectivized and controlled on their own at great expense and over time. Um, but they set standards. And that was very important. In the research that we did, uh, uh, we found um, not only how people were using them, but the success of a geographical indication or a regional brand had to do with uh, the quality associated with it. And a standard was the way that was done, particularly with agricultural products, but with other products as well. And um, investment, continued investment. And that can bring those results. So the production standards, investment, and time bring this. And it's heaps good. But what is it that you, what, what products might, 
might this uh, apply to? And uh, South Australia is full of them. And I, these are all, you know, ag and uh, aquaculture, horticulture, all kinds of things. If you're doing regional branding, the agriculture is the gem, and everything that goes with it can rise as well. And that's what the Barossa is trying to do because here's the Barossa trust mark origin, our sense of place, integrity, our sense of purpose. Quality, our sense of ambition. Environment, our sense of responsibility. And community, our sense of belonging. Hill of Grace, one of the best wines produced in Australia. Absolutely fabulous job. Maybe the best wine um, is on this list. As is, as a, but as is lamb from Hutton Vale Farm. Uh, Barossa Valley, ballooning is on the list. Metwurst is on the list, uh, different uh, bed and breakfasts are on the list, and sourdough bread from the local bakery is on the list. The starter, they, uh, they started making sourdough in 1924, and they've used the same starter ever since. So they've just kept it going. And those are regional products that they want to champion, and it's really on the back of the wine that they're doing it. So are you limited in scope? No, not in regional branding. And your agriculture, for example, can actually build your regional economy around other services and other products. Um, it can help. And that's, what, um, and that's what they're trying to do. And that's how we do it here in Australia, with the same names and the same uh, identifiers we are a place that takes part in regional branding. And with uh, recognition of that and proper support for that and proper understanding of that, we can build value in a lot of terrific South Australian brands. Kangaroo Island, honey. The seafood here is outrageous. The water's so clean. Spirits, you notice that people are making spirits locally now? There's whiskey and uh, uh, gin on Kangaroo Island. Um, I don't know how I got off Kangaroo Island, but I ended up back here somehow. Um, cider in the Adelaide Hills. Um, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of beautiful things. But this is the key that people are trying to, uh, to, to people are trying to unlock this, this, this question of how to capture it. And the unfortunate thing for me to tell them is standards, which are, have to be implemented, investment, which is hard to come by, and time. But this is what you can get. And uh, for some of those brands that have actually achieved this, they're tremendous. And the results and the, uh, the benefits have been terrific. For those who haven't done it all the way, who haven't done it quite well enough or haven't thought through how they're doing it, they have had mixed results. So it has to, has to involve good, trustworthy production standards, investment, and time. Now that's enough for me. Um, normally, if we were my students, I'd say, go away. But, um, but um, uh, that's a lot of information, and I really uh, gave you the, the, the short, not technical version of it. But um, if you have any questions about that, about how that might work here, or what it, uh, or anything, you have got a question about uh, how you're going to get home tonight, uh, feel free, because uh, that's what I'm here for, and not to take you home. But uh, thank you.